All right. Welcome, everyone, to Unsafe Space Book Club. Uh, I'm your host, Carter Laren, and I'm joined by Carrie Smith. Carrie, say something. Hello, Carter. Thanks for doing all the tech on your end. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. I, I, I did have some issues on my end. I apologize for that. But uh, it's because uh, when you upgrade to Mojave, apparently Zoom doesn't work anymore. So, you know, little things. Um, Carrie, so everyone today, book is Animal Farm. I have to admit, which I've already admitted elsewhere on our channel, I didn't, I didn't read it because I read it last year. And I and I want to read it again, so I apologize, but I just read it. So, this is I'm a horrible book club host. <laughs> Sorry. Wait a minute. I was trying to. I was looking at Laura's note that says she can't see anyone except Carter, and there's reverb. Is anybody else having oh. trouble, or is that just Laura? I don't hear any reverb on Carter. Yeah, me either. Laura, try leaving and rejoining because it may have been because you joined last. I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, um, or, or you might be connected two different ways. So yeah. you get the audio feed two different ways when one has a slight delay. I don't even yeah. see Laura. Yeah, I don't see her either. Uh, uh, maybe she left after that. To yeah, try I tried leaving and, re and rejoining. Okay, so Carter. Yeah. Why, why were you saying you're a bad book club host? I'm a bad host because I didn't I didn't read the book. I read it last year with my daughter, so I didn't oh. reread it. Uh, oh, that's okay. You've I read apologize. it recently. I'm busy reading Human Action, by the way, by Von Mises. And uh, if you want a deep, awesome freaking book, uh, I did not realize how awesome Von Mises was. So um, I'm, well, I have a another, man crush. But another that's okay. Day. That's, a, <laughs> that's another day. Yeah. <laughs> Today's book is <laughs> Animal Farm by George Orwell. <laughs> Uh, well, I I read most of it this morning. I had read about half of Some it. Some books I, are more equal than others, Carrie. Yeah, That's some books are more say. equal than others. So I restarted <laughs> it again today. And this is a pretty quick read. Um, welcome, first of all, everybody who's in book club. Uh, I said beforehand, and I'll just, just to remind people, if you're not talking, put your microphone on mute so there's no background noise, and then just hit unmute when you want to say something. We're glad that you guys could join us. Uh, why don't we start it the way we usually do, where we kind of get people's first impressions. And I'll go first. Yeah. I like, I like, I, I feel, I like that he used animals. I think it made it really accessible for people that maybe wouldn't read this kind of a book about the subject otherwise. And I thought he almost like Ray Bradbury, he was very um, efficient with language. He didn't use too much language. It didn't make it longer than it needed to be. And also I cried at the end. <laughs> so I didn't expect <laughs> to cry. Those are my first thoughts. What about you guys? How about I love, but I love the farm analogy. Obviously, like that's, uh, okay. I mean, that's why I, I one of the one of the reasons I use the farm analogy is because this book. I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's spectacular, and I, w I wish more people would think of themselves as farm animals. I, I loved it. I haven't read this book obviously since I don't even know middle school, <laughs> um, and so it was really good to revisit it. And I just have to say that this book club. Like every time we read a book, I'm like, this is so timely, you know, and I thought it couldn't get better than 1984 and Brave New World and then Fahrenheit 451 really blew my mind. And then reading this particularly now in lockdown was just mind blowing yes. for me, like how relevant it is to literally write this second. Yeah, That's I agree. It's, it was easy I mean, that, to draw one, I analogies. Like, yeah, one of the things I like was that the rules were changing, but no one was supposed to notice that the the, <laughs> the rules were always changing. Um, but they were written down, so they must be correct. Uh, and Squealer kind of as like the that. mainstream media that was just constantly promoting the propaganda and changing everybody's opinion. And it was so much that was just like, oh my gosh, that's this person in real life. Yeah. Oh, I see more people have joined us. Hi, Jeanette, Marie. Oh, I'll I'll try and keep Laura, up. Laura, uh, Debbie people. Chandler's here. Uh, Kent. Debbie's raising her hand. I don't know what that means, Debbie, but you are Keith? recognized. Debbie has the floor Tara? if you want to raise your hand for a reason. I don't know. Yeah, Debbie. Let's see. Uh, 
I'm going to unmute you, Debbie, because you're trying uh, to talk. Okay. Um, first impressions on this book. First of all, this is at least the fourth time I've read it. First time, so it's not really a first first impression. First time was in high school, junior high, don't remember which. Um, I am a retired homeschool educator. Two of my children had to slog through this, as they put it. They're country children. They disliked a lot of details of how the animals act. This time I read it, and first of all, it was so quick. I was thinking it was gonna take me 12, 15 hours, but it was so quick. And it's so very timely, like Nicole said. Yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah. the, well, like Nicole said, and like you're saying, the timeliness of it. Um, I, I, one thing that I know we've all been talking about farm animals a lot recently and sheep and the, and the way that people just kind of, it's human nature maybe for, for us to sometimes just go along with the group. And I thought there was, he had some good, like good sense of humor in here about some things. And, and the fact that the chorus were sheep, of course they were sheep and they were bleeding and they would just drown everyone else out by bleeding the same phrase over and over. It's like, that kind of reminds me of mob, like groups, mobs, what happens, especially, you know, some of the stuff we talk about, like ideologues, like repeating the same, like almost copying and pasting the same slogans and stuff. Um, so yeah, that was kind of, I love that he took them away. He took the sheep away for a week so he could, they could teach them a new slogan. What do you think the overall um, message slash reason was for um, having, I always thought it was interesting that, that he has the people who were farm animals rise to become the oppressors themselves. Um, and I always viewed it as a pretty horrible I mean, maybe I'm wrong about what his intention was, but I always viewed it as like an indictment of democracy as such, um, just because it's like, well, you know, yes, they were the farm animals that were oppressed, but given the opportunity uh, and given the support of the animal community, they basically become the farmers. Oh, I thought, it... sorry, go ahead, Nicole. Are you sure? Yeah, go. I thought it was kind of an indictment of mankind and human nature that once given power, every human is it's just in their nature to turn into that. And so the pigs turn into the humans. What do you think his solution would have been? I mean, we know what Orwell was, you know, what we, he believed, but was there a solution implicit in Animal Farm or was it just like a commentary on... Uh, humans suck <laughs> i mean what was, what, 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 what was it I, I think his solution it's just like 1984 what he wanted to do is people to, to just expose it for what it really is and then the people will fix it he doesn't say how to solve the problem he's just working on the problem of recognizing that you're a farm animal same as 1984 yeah what i was uh what i was gonna say um which is kind of like what Nicole was going to say is like we had a prime example of it today. Um, I live in Illinois and Lori Lightfoot, who is the mayor of Chicago, who, um, by the way, has done some heinous stuff like go and get her hair done and post pictures on social media, um, even though no one else can do that because she's like the face of Chicago. So she has to look good. Well, today she went out and had this really huge news tele television thing rant she ranted about how terrible everyone is because they're partying in their own homes and we're gonna find you I mean the language that she used if you can go out and look even listen to the clip now okay so she is a she's a woman of color she is a lesbian who is married to a same-sex partner so she's like a person who is like uh, in oppressed classes, obviously, everyone would agree that that would be what her position is. Now she has risen to a position of power. She is the mayor of Chicago, which is obviously the biggest city in, in Illinois. And she is basically oppressing everyone. I mean, the language she used was, um, it was unbelievable to me. She, she, um, 
shamed everyone who had gone to any, had been out of their houses. I mean, there was shaming, there was threatening, we'll send the police, we will arrest you, we will, you know, we'll, we'll give you citations, and we will arrest you if you go out of your house, if you have a party, and if, if there is anyone who's doing any of these things, you need to, they had the, they had a, they gave a number so you can report on your neighbors. It, I mean, it was just like, that's, I mean, that's kind of what, it was shocking to me hearing her talk and the people that think that she is protecting people and the self-righteousness that she had of saying that, you know, you're just that other people are selfish because they're not doing as they're told it was shocking. I think it's interesting what you're saying about her getting her hair done and saying like she needs to get it done because she's the face of Chicago. It's like the, uh, the pigs. Like Napoleon. Yeah. They have to sleep in the house because they need to be well rested because they're in charge of everything. <laughs> you know, the rules are different <laughs> for them. Yeah. EC Homer, by the way, we just we just got a super chat, which we can't put on the screen during Zoom, so I apologize, but thank you, EC Homer. He says, the benevolent dictator is a very rare thing. Yeah, I mean, if if at all. What do you guys think the book says about, uh, one of the things that bothers me about the book and humanity in general is how easily people are uh, swayed and manipulated. And I mean, because you're reading the book and it's, What's going on is pretty obvious to you, the reader, but to all the animals, it works just fine. Well, I think for the most part, people are just quiet. I think that that's what sh shocked me reading it this time is how many were like, wow, there's something wrong with this, but they, they're like, mm, I don't, the people that don't say anything because maybe they doubt their own memory of what the rules were when they were set up, the seven rules or they just don't want to be, you know, to buck the system, to be the one that stands out. Or then later on, the ones that are like fearful because they were like, oh, I might get hurt myself physically if I say something against this. So all of those things are things that are manipulative and are things that are being used by our own society right now, even during this time. I think Orwell too, though, was also very clever at choosing the characters of the animals to the characteristics that he wanted to portray. So the sheep having the mantra all the time, you know, four legs bad, two legs good, um, is, I mean, if I grew up on a farm, so sheep, I mean, sheep are dumb, really dumb. Um, so he did that, <laughs> but then you had the chickens, you know, the chickens who spent time in the hen house together as a group away from the other animals. Um, you know, you noticed a number of times the chickens, if there was going to be a little bit of dissent, that was actually with the chickens until, you know, they got too squawky and then they end of chickens, you know. So they, he was really, really clever at going around and assigning quite uh, the personalities to the animals uh, to reflect those sorts of characteristics. And even Boxer, who I'm still crying, um, he was, he, you know that dependable you know he was a pack horse you know he was dependable he was never going to let anybody down that was his role in life was to be utterly dependable and even down to the dogs you know I mean those of us that own dogs dogs are bred to be loyal dogs will serve a master and they were there to serve Napoleon because that was their job yeah yeah so Sorry, good I just woke That's up right. I didn't realize it was going to be a zoom I literally just woke up oh you look good no, that's so right. And pigs are really, really smart that, you know, pigs have a really high intelligence for animals. They really do. One of the things I thought helped make the book is which animals he picked for which thing. Like the animals he chose were excellent. You know, the dogs and the pigs and all of them, Squealer and the names he gives them are excellent. Like it makes it very easy to see the analogy. I thought it was kind of funny that he gave one of the pigs a historical name Napoleon but then the other one's called Snowball <laughs> like just kind of that juxtaposition itself was kind of silly like he was thinking I gotta give a meaningful name for one of these pigs and then the other one I'm gonna give a pig name <laughs> and so I Homer in chat writes what what or who or what did Benjamin represent I think that's a good question actually well I mean I don't know necessarily from George Orwell's perspective but 
being married to a man who grew up under a pretty severe, you know, communist dictatorship. And, you know, even before then, I mean, life was really difficult um, in Romania. Like, I really see, like, my husband and my in-laws as really kind of being like Benjamin. They know what's going on. They knew that the whole revolution was bullshit. Like, like they, they knew, but they kept their mouth shut to survive. Um, you know, I mean, they're originally from the country. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff they were able to avoid some of like the, the worst part, worst parts about it, um, because they were in the country, but like, I just see the Benjamin as someone, you know, someone who's smart, someone who kind of knows what's going on, but is quiet to, to survive. And I see, I see that a lot in my husband and and his family and like even you know today in this country my husband is very much like you need to be quiet you need to not say things on social media things like that maybe kind of a fatalistic approach as in it doesn't really matter what we do things are always going to be somewhat the same different dictators exactly same and that's yeah, exactly. And that's very much um, part of like my like Romanian fam, like like their outlook on the world. Like life is, you know, you work hard. Life is kind of crap. Um, you rest when you die, that kind of thing. They really have kind of um, that kind of outlook on life. But I mean, they care, they care much more about like the little things. Um, yeah, within their own family, but like, you know, outside the family, you know, life is crap, basically. It it's really seems like Benjamin was the one that was right in the end. Like he was the only one that was right. In the end, it really wasn't going to work out and life was still going to suck. It's kind of a Russian attitude, right? Or for me, you know, yes, yes very much. <laughs> Does anybody know, like, I don't, I just can't, bring up the history of um, what like the Russian revolution or anything, but I mean, I've read that Napoleon is Stalin and Snowball's Trotsky, but I don't know, I didn't have time to go like look up the background of Trotsky. Was, is anybody else heard that? Well, I do know he was much more idealistic um, like between him and Stalin, Stalin was very much an authoritarian and i think stalin used like the exact tactics that napoleon does i'm pretty sure it was a fairly you know bald kind of caricature of the russian revolution wasn't trotsky more of a i thought trotsky was more of like the world needs to uh, unite together and stalin was more nationalistic in his uh, i mean he had grand he had plans that involved the world, but they were predominantly uh, conquering rather than uh, kind of the world rising up as one. I thought I thought that was the main difference, but I'm not actually totally sure. Does anyone know Trotsky versus Stalin there? I think the and I'm not I don't know that much about Trotsky. I did read a book on young Stalin before he gained a ton of power and how he kind of came to power. But um, I think that the tactics that Napoleon uses specifically to then like turn around and start blaming everything on Snowball and then saying you know like oh he was like an insurgent from the beginning and everything you remember he's always been like allied with the enemy and how it progresses over the book of villainizing Snowball um, I'm pretty sure is like baldly stolen so it, the people in chat are kind of answering for me a little bit, saying Trotsky was the real Marxist. Uh, and Low Res Boy writes, Trotsky, constant revolution, Stalin, people in charge of the group. Um, so I guess that makes sense uh, in terms of the pig sort of, I, I guess you could draw that analogy. And then getting, getting blamed, nope. uh, the real Marxist getting blamed, I don't know. 
I had a copy from the library at my um, son's college. That's where I finally got my book. And um, what's the name of the crow? Is it a crow that flies in and out? Oh, oh Moses. Yeah. So there was a note in the margin in this book that 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 the that the role of Moses is religion. What what are you guys' thoughts on that? I thought it was an. Oh yeah. 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 Like Moses definitely represented the Orthodox Church. Um, and and in chapter nine, I or chapter eight, no, I don't know if it was nine or eight. I'm sorry, I think it was chapter eight at the end. Um, Napoleon kind of lets him back in where he returns and Napoleon's okay with it. And he's like the preacher and Sugar Candy Mountain is um, like the heaven awaiting. Um, and I wrote down more animals are believing in this while their re reality kind of turns more and more grim. They're turning to sort of listen to that and Napoleon After allows nine. it so that they won't, you know, focus on him, I think. That's kind of what I thought the commentary on religion almost being, so I think Orwell saying religion is a distraction from the reality of your oppression. I think that fits with Orwell's uh, overall because he was a socialist at the end of the day, right? So I think I think that fits with his viewpoint, right? Yeah, and from a historical perspective, I, there were a lot of priests, monks, and nuns who were sent to the gulag, like you know, who were really true to the faith, and you know, those people were eventually replaced with. I mean, you never knew if your priest, you know, was a spy. And so, like, you know, people who, grew, you know, grew up under that, like, you know, my husband, like, they were very, I mean, it's, they couldn't always go to church. Um, so they couldn't even count on the sacred part of the, um, like, when you give confession, they couldn't even, like, count on that because they might be, a, they might be spies. Exactly. Like they, you, you could not depend on um, their priests keeping like confession secret as they are supposed to. And I think that was. Well, I mean, any authoritarian of, class, right? Re, they re, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, that was an important part of, um, you know, Moses went away, meaning like from my view, um, you know, the, the good, like the true priests and monks and nuns were essentially persecuted or killed. And then, you know, new ones rose in their place who, you know, basically supported the party. Right. I mean, this makes sense, right? Any authoritarian ideology can't abide other belief systems with, with, with moral codes outside of their own. So exactly like, well, they especially can, but they can only abide it if it's if they view it as like something that's not a threat so like at the end when they let moses come back in it's almost like and it, i think they even use the word contemptuous like they the pigs look down on the stories of sugar candy mountain or whatever is with content but they allowed it it's almost like they weren't didn't feel threatened by by it by then so they had to yeah. get rid of the religion in the beginning. So just like in the mm -hmm. Soviet Union, they suppressed all religion. And then once they got total control, they let a little back in. You know? Same reason mm -hmm. they keep the flow of vodka going. Well, yeah. does that yes. kind of go with some of what we're seeing with uh, religious leaders of the day? I mean, we have people who have stayed true to their beliefs as far as what they believe to be true with in regards to their beliefs of the Bible and stuff. And then there are other ones that have like moved away from that, from from the beliefs, and they've gone into like more SJW type belief systems, and they've kind of diluted their their faith, or you know they've made it more palatable to the masses. Um, so that would be kind of the same thing, wouldn't it be? It's like they're um, you're no longer speaking what you you're making it to where people are not going to be offended by what you're saying. So you're, you're watering it down. You're not a threat to the culture. Right. 
Like, like in right. the beginning when the pigs are making the rules, like Carter said, you know, the pigs are going to tell you what, what's right and wrong. What your rights are comes from the pigs, from the government. And Moses was kind of violating that. So they had to run him out. But then when he comes back later, he just, they give him a beer and he just talks about Sugar Candy Mountain. Like, just work hard, deal with this. It's okay if you're really hungry, but eventually you're going to go to Sugar Candy Mountain. And so they're, they let him get so away. So your suffering here doesn't matter. So, because later on you'll have something better. That kind of thing. Right? Yeah. I mean, Sugar Candy Mountain's heaven, right? That's why he picked the name Moses. You know, it's not, I don't think it's any specific religion. He just used a name that everybody would recognize. But it's the same kind of thing, right? That, that the religion, uh, the, 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 you know, some people call it objective standard of rights that come from a religion. It's a fixed list and the pigs might want to violate that so they can't tolerate it. But once they get total control, they can let a little in. It doesn't hurt. In fact, it's good because it can help ease the, the pain and suffering that's being caused by the pigs. That's why that they point. start giving them a ration of beer, right? When Moses came back towards the end after a couple of years and he was just talking about Sugar Candy Mountain, they give him a beer. Pigs give him a beer. Right. Speaking of good, aptly named characters, uh, Squealer was an interesting character. And for me, you know, he, he did the job of spreading propaganda. Like he was the, let me go out into the, into the, the masses and tell it and smooth everything over and spin a good story. He was like the media. <laughs> He's the Anderson Cooper of the story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the Brian Stelter. <laughs> but, I, I yeah. was Brian Squealer. Can we start calling him Squealer. Brian Squealer? Yeah. I was, uh, I was reading Squealer. Chris Cuomo. As, I was, when I was reading Squealer, I was reading him as Rachel Maddow. <laughs> oh. He definitely, I wrote down multiple times, almost every single chapter had like a instance of squealer gaslighting. Like I was like, I think mm. this is the best sort of um, example I've read in a book about absolute gaslighting. Like you didn't actually hear that. You don't, no, 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 no. You're remembering wrong. You're, you know, that sort of propaganda or just flat out crazy town maybe he is chris cuomo then uh, <laughs> oh Lori, that Lori, me, i wrote that down too where oh, he ahead. said um i wrote down chris cuomo because where did he um i'll look for it go ahead I'll i was just gonna say Lori flagler in chat says something that i thought was interesting um which is uh she says the animal's best qualities were used against them uh I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective, but I think that's true. Uh, anyone else boxer. have thoughts on that? Yeah, Boxer was the prime example of that. I mean, his best quality is right. he was loyal to his dying day and that was abused, you know, right from the get-go. Must work harder, must work harder, must work harder. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he And they knew that. Um, and also for me as well with Napoleon is it was... <clears throat> the long game that he played because he started stealing milk right from the very beginning of the revolution and whisked those dogs away. So this wasn't an overnight success. This wasn't a, you know, the long game was already there and he was playing on each of those personalities, like playing on the fact that he knew Boxer was loyal. He knew that Snowball was actually probably brighter than he was and was going to create all of those plans, but we don't get rid of Snowball until after we have all the plans that we need to achieve that what we need to achieve and then we steal them. We know that Squeal is going to do our job and Squeal and propaganda and get everybody up to speed. And yeah, so this it's he, Napoleon was the ultimate reader of the personality of all the animals and he used all their personalities against them, basically in a long game to his own end. It was the long con. Right. And even the allies were thrown yeah. under the bus at the end, just like would happen in what has happened in the rise of Stalin and other dictators. That's really so good. You know what? I wonder about Boxer. I just thought of this, Carrie. I wonder if Boxer is kind of like one of those people, like what you talk about, who really have, um, like, you know, when you talk about people who work really, you know, they have, um, they don't have bad intent. 
Mm-hmm. They're people with yeah. good, like people with a good heart who like give all, all they have to it. Yes. To the purpose, but they, they don't understand that they're working hard for something that doesn't really, you know, isn't really a good thing in the end, but they, they really do have a good heart. Like I, I see Boxer as one of those type of people who, you know, they can't really think it all out themselves or they don't stop to think it all out themselves because they're too busy just working so hard trying to accomplish a purpose. You know, do you think that yeah. that's like the... Oh yeah, it's funny. And think of how many times you hear SJWs online say, you know, you need to do the work. <laughs> um, I don't know, that just popped in my head. And they're always like, do the work, but it's like a lifelong thing you commit yourself to. Of well, and this is something you've talked about in yeah. the past, Carrie, right? Which is that social justice warriors, and this is uh, one of the Saul Alinsky tactics, right? They use your qual- your best qualities against you. Um, so if you have standards, they use those standards against you for, to, as a means to their own ends. They don't have standards, um, but it doesn't matter that they don't have standards. They're gonna, they know you do, um, and they're gonna use them. So, yeah, um, yeah, I think I could, I could definitely see that analogy that that yeah he's he's loyal to the cause he's a true believer and gives it his all even even gets in the van to take him to his death you know um when he's too weak to to fight back once he realizes what's happening oh my gosh and the way they the way that squealer smoothed over his death was just like you said carter earlier you asked as the reader, we can see all of this coming. We see all of this, but you know, if the animals, they just go along with it and it's kind of amazing, but everything's incremental. It's incremental. When I was buying into SJW ideology and I assume it's like this maybe with any kind of rigid or fundamental belief system, it was incremental because the end is a lot. Like if they were to tell me at the beginning and we want you to defend censorship and violence like no <laughs> but you get there right. eventually you'll be slaughtered and racism. <laughs> right and racism yeah. and sexism and no but that but it's incremental and and just like with this um the covid crisis and these restrictions in in our constitutional freedoms i think it's like this is an incremental thing you know you get people to accept something i have a friend who is um, visiting who's going to be staying with me for a while from california and she was saying that it's it's been incremental there and one of the things they've done is they keep changing the date when they're going to reopen i'm sure this is happening in other places so you get used to the, they wouldn't just tell you up front we're not going to reopen until june you know but now but they're like okay maybe at the end of april and then the, oh, mid-May. And now like on the California side, it says to be determined. <laughs> like, just indefinite. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, okay, I found going back to the um, squealer mainstream media guy propaganda in chapter seven, when they were kind of doing propaganda because of the shortage from the heart winter. And then Napoleon sort of runs around and detects snowballs, footprints and everything and calls for um a full investigation (laughs) made me laugh because you know they're always calling for full investigation (laughs) at the same time um the chris cuomo of animal farm was referencing the secret documents that they had Mm -hmm. and it totally made me think of chris cuomo saying like it's illegal for you to read wikileaks but we know I have to read it and I'll tell you, but you can't know. These are secret documents that we have. And I think um, Orwell also hit on how you have to pull in entertainment and Hollywood because he replaces, you know, he sort of gives a big status to Minimus who is like the new poet and songwriter or whatever. So Minimus is like Hollywood and he's right up there next to Napoleon and Squealer, the mainstream media. Absolutely. I've, yeah, Minimus. It made me think of the um, Soviet art, you know, the propaganda art, which some of that stuff is so cold. I've, I, just the feeling I get from looking at it. And I think that's because propaganda comes first. The art is secondary to the message. But the, the flag? with the hoof and the horn, literally like the hammer and sickle. 
it was so like vivid in my mind immediately I was actually going to draw the the flag because I could see it so well yeah but by, by the way just I'm just sharing silly chats when I see them uh EC Homer says no farm animal is dumb enough to be Don Lemon might be true uh, hey might be true <laughs> <laughs> That's a great observation, Nicole. I didn't even think of the, of course, of course, the hammer and the sickle. You should draw that. I'd like to see it. So does anyone remember what were the original rules that were uh, on the barn and how did they change? <laughs> well, I know they changed the alcohol one to, right? In excess. In excess. <laughs> right. Or, you, you know, no farm animals will sleep in beds with sheep, you know? I mean, so it's it's just a tiny little change that makes, you know, makes it okay for me to do what I want to do. And they still use blankets, which I was like, that's such a technicality. <laughs> yeah. I, that, that part made me laugh too. <laughs> we sleep, do you think we want to sleep it? I love how everything was a great burden for the elite. Do you think we, do you we think we want to wanna sleep. be sleeping? We don't want to be in the house. We have so much work we have to do. Of course we have to sleep in the, in the bed in, in, you know, without sheep. We're sleeping oh, with and of course we have, sheep. and of course we have to get a haircut during quarantine. Do you think we want to get a haircut? Right. Oh. Yeah. Dad. Yeah. <laughs> We're the face, We're the face of, of Chicago. We have to represent. Same thing. So sick. Ugh. Wombat of Doom in chat writes, uh, at the end of chapter eight, Squealer falling from the ladder while changing the rules was like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I think that's true, right? Exactly. Is that kind of an ad attitude like, oh, don't, you know, go back to sleep. And no animal pay shall attention. kill another animal without just cause. <laughs> without just cause. Yeah, that was, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. That's the thing with just cause, isn't it? It's almost like the greater good. What is a just cause? Yeah, I can't remember. Well, it was it gets to define it, been, it, right? It might have been just without cause. Does anybody remember what the add-on was for no animal shall kill another animal? I think it was without cause. Just the words without cause, not even just. Might be wrong, but I think it was just without cause. Yeah, when I when I said just cause, I think it's because I'm used to saying that phrase, <laughs> but that isn't what they said. This yeah, is my, they did this the alcohol my... one was like two excess. They just added two excess, uh, but I don't see that. I can't find the just cause one or the other one. So to go to go what ahead. we were, were just talking about, this was my favorite part in the book. Allow me to read just this little. You're, you're free to read something that you guys like too. But this is the. Do you think I want to get this haircut, comrades? He cried. You do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness and privilege. <laughs> Many of us actually dislike milk and apples. I dislike them myself. Our sole object in taking these things is to preserve our health. Milk and apples, I love them. I mark this because they use science. This has been proved by science, comrades. <laughs> Contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. The whole management and organization of this farm depend on us day and night. We're watching over your welfare. It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat those apples. <laughs> <laughs> that part just cracked me up. I know. I love that. Thing too. I, that's, I, this by the way, it, it is without by cause, science. by the way. <laughs> yeah. That was so perfect. I Because, I mean, I hear that every single day. So I it's believe for your in science. And it's for your own good that you're forced <laughs> to not be able to go to work. Um, yeah. Anyway, I love that part. Yeah. That idea I wanted to throw out for people to think about. So one thing that was brought up was these constant little reminders. The pigs are a little more clever. We should trust the pigs. They're a little more clever. That, that mm. was five or six different times in different contexts that was measured. And I think I'd probably mention this maybe to Carrie or Carter, or both of you and messages and stuff. There's always that, but education, get educated. 
it's just it's so passive but it's another little gaslighting oh i'm smarter than you so you should trust me whereas you think about certain parts of the world where there's only two or three people in a country that have an education well they end up being the dictators so it's just it was a really interesting thing that the smart people that the rest of us are supposed to trust have the tools if they have a little bit of evil to turn it into a, an enormous amount of power if i put that out there right for everyone yeah and they still do it they do it with uh universities like oh the, the, you'll hear the left all the time talk about how well uh phds are more likely to be leftists or whatever like they'll they'll always they'll always talk about how the left is quote better educated which means been through indoctrination camps but like and that's that they use that language all the time to justify stuff but the propaganda for it starts in pre-k where they lay the groundwork yep. that if you don't follow you know the the cookie cutter mold straight into university and and then now straight into a master's program that that's what deems a person intelligent and smart and so it almost like create psychologically this class system where you say, well, if I don't go that route, anybody else that does is automatically smarter than me. I have friends so you kind of buy into it. I, I mean, they do it to me all the time in threads. They throw out, and I saw somebody do it to Carrie too. Just oh yeah, she went to the compare thread. degrees. Yep, let's I don't all compare <laughs> how smart we are and like, let's throw out and you know, I mean, and I have a friend that does this literally all the time. She will like give out stats of how Republicans are more like uneducated and call they, you know, Democrats have more college education. It's like, and she, you know, whenever I call her on it, I'm like, listen, you know, what are you saying? What is it exactly that you're saying? Are you saying that, you know, myself, uh, that people like me are not smart enough to make these like, you know, these connections ourselves because we don't have like, you know, letters behind our name. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. But that is exactly, that is exactly what, what they're saying. saying. So it's like, it's a form of dishonesty as well. It's like this, it's this slam. It's this slam of to say you are stupid and I'm smarter than you because I've had more formal education and so you know, even though I can't make a coherent thought of my own, of my own opinion, which she cannot, you know, she can't like tell you why she believes in something, but she has this degree. Mm -hmm. And so therefore she is far more like able to speak, you know, she's in the elite class compared to people like myself who have only had a few college hours because we're, you know, you know, people who are less than that is that is that is direct correlation of what she's saying and i can i just pop in this is my first Yay. time um, yeah, please. <laughs> Welcome. um but i wanted to say that some of the dumbest things i've heard have come out of highly educated people's mouths just like some of the most racist things i've ever heard have come out of leftist mouths and i have blocked more people in the last week <laughs> than I have ever before because it's 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 like talking to a brick wall and they do nothing but insult and I don't know I just wanted to pop in and say that <laughs> so. well you're right it's yeah, like the, the more educated not always but to a large degree it's what Carter is saying the more indoctrinated like so I so I definitely hear very dumb things coming out of the mouths of highly educated people and also People, I don't even think it's like, I mean, there are some people I know who with very high IQ, who, you know, ideology is a powerful drug. <laughs> it, it can like, you can have be an IQ, a high IQ person and believe some very dumb things or be led to believe some very dumb things and capable of repeating those things. But um, yeah, I agree with you. Jeanette, I'm welcome. I'm glad hey. you're here. First time. <laughs> I always talk to you. I just, it's Yay. just behind the keyboard. But I did want to say too, I had someone, I can't remember what I posted, but it was something along the lines of, it was give me liberty or give me death, that meme, or uh, give me liberty unless it's a disease. You know, you've seen it. It's unless it's something 
uh, that we might catch and then we have to stay in our houses and whatever. And I had a woman who's in the medical community. She's married to a doctor. My husband happens to be one as well. And the things she said to me about how dare you say such a thing and your husband's a doctor and how can you feel like this? And what about all these people that are gonna be affected? And I, you know, I just said, it's about choice. It's about freedom to go out. If those people are vulnerable, stay in. It's been that whole, that was one of the people I had to block. She wouldn't stop. And I've actually been very good friends with her off and on. I just didn't know how crazed she was about this whole situation, but anyway. That was, that was where I was going with that. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. How dare you? How dare me? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the thing well, about IQ, the book... IQ is just, I, sorry, some people in chat are actually are talking about IQ as well. Like, IQ is just uh, how fast your car goes. It's not, it doesn't have nothing to do with the direction your car is going. Like you need a map that's valid. And if you don't have a good map and if you've got a map to hell, IQ will get you there. High IQ gets you there faster. It gets you there uh, faster. So that's a good way of putting it. it does, <laughs> IQ is not like, it's great. It's great to be smart uh, and have a high IQ, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not, it doesn't substitute for a moral compass. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's, it's worse. It's better to have dumb people with, authoritarian designs than it is to have really smart people who want to be authoritarians because uh, dumb people are easy to defeat. Um, do you think, do you guys think that Napoleon from the very beginning knew what he wanted or do you think it evolved during the book? No, I think he had a very clear goal because he started right from the beginning. He took that milk and those puppies right from the get go. And he, you know, so he, he had a very, very, he was there for the slow burn. Um, I think that was, he had a very, very clear goal and he just played everybody. He massaged them, he manipulated them. And, and it's not only, he not only manipulated all the other animals in the barn, he manipulated all the other pigs, particularly Snowball. You know, he, he knew what he was doing. Yeah, I think, I, I I think sometimes people, um, yeah, I tend to agree too. I think in, in, life sometimes people who um get to these places where they are in a, a place of power and they start um losing empathy for others and they start abusing that power i think sometimes they're really good at lying to themselves though they make make plans and lay groundwork but it's almost like they keep part of themselves in the dark i, I i'm fascinated yeah, no, about the I, ways I, that people lie to themselves I think it's the, you know, you care, you bring this up a lot, the, the elephant and the rider thing, right, from Jonathan Haidt. But I think this is one of the dangers with the, the credentialism of education, right? If you have a desire to be a little bit of an authority, a little Napoleon, right? If you want to be a little Napoleon, if you want to be a busybody and uh, get your way with people, you will, you will rationalize that if someone gives you the tools to rationalize it. And if they say, oh, well, now that you've gone to Harvard, Here's the reason. This is a reason why you should be in charge of other people. Oh, now you have a PhD. This is a reason. Now you have an MD. This is a reason why you should tell everyone to stay at home and screw philosophy. Like it doesn't rights are irrelevant. You have an MD. Uh, like anything. It's but it it all stems from a psychological drive to be some kind of a little Napoleon, and all those other things just enable that. Uh, and I think that's what's dangerous. That's why psychology is way more important to me than intelligence or knowledge or anything. Yeah, I, I saw that chat that Carrie was talking about on her Facebook page, and it's exactly that. The, the person was a, uh, she, she comes back, her entire argument, Carrie makes this excellent point, like very well thought out, nicely written. She comes back and says, well, I have a MBA and a law degree from USC. That, like that's her entire argument. And, you know, it's, they have, uh, there was nothing else. She presented no other argument. And I replied and, and, you know, I see that the same as a social justice word. There's a lot of attorneys that have that same attitude and law school in the U S is just like the SJW indoctrination camps. It's like getting a gender studies degree for a lot of these people. She, she, she's totally indoctrinated. And I replied and told her, well, Everybody in this chat has an advantage over you. They didn't go to law school. <laughs> you can just read the Constitution. It's easy to read. It takes like I love you, Keith. in English. <laughs> he was funny. Well, hey, here's the good thing. You, I, 
one of the things about that particular conversation was because like we've said, people with high IQ that can just get you get your card or authoritarianism faster doesn't necessarily mean anything. But yes, what she was attempting to do was equate credentials with IQ, which is bullshit. And I wasn't about to whip out mine. I don't like peer pressure. Tell me yours. Like, no. But it's a bit like she had already demonstrated in that particular chat. She didn't understand the basic definitions of some words. And it's like, so it's a bit, it, it's a bit like being lousy at sex, but then pointing to your expensive lingerie. But look at this thing. Look at what I bought. <laughs> So I was like, if anybody wants to use that in the future, so I made myself laugh. I was like, oh, really? but I bought this at Victoria's Secret. <laughs> anyway, credentialism. Here, here's something about that. Just a little bit off a branch off of that discussion. The fact that they're not allowed to read or that it's not that they're not allowed to read in this book. He makes it so that, you know, certain animals, they have different abilities. And so some can't read and, and Nicole pointed to this earlier when they when Squealer keeps telling them, oh, we found these secret documents, but you know, he, they Squealer says, I would let you read it in his own, own handwriting if you could read. And they really take advantage of their their um their their lack of ability to read. And they they don't um it made me think of something a friend recently told me that I I was really ignorant about. She was telling me about the history of the church and how they did something similar with the Bible, how they wouldn't allow people to read the Bible, that they said, much like Chris Cuomo and WikiLeaks, we have to read the Bible for you, we authorities, and we will it's, tell you. It's in Latin for a reason. Yes. For a while. And I know that's ignorant of me not really realizing that before, but um, that kind of blew my mind, keeping the people separate from the word of God. You know, it's a different well, kind wasn't of it the, authoritarianism, wasn't it the, but it is, that's what it is. Yeah, wasn't it the proliferation of the Bible in a readable format that led to the split of the church par par partly? Um, yeah, the, the and, original, and led to all the denominations, yeah. If you go far enough back, the, the priests, way back, the Christian priests didn't want anybody to read the Bible. They had a, a shit fit when the printing press came out. People started printing it. Like it, it was taking away their role. And and. So in Orwell, he even better than not being able, not being able to read or not reading is just not being able to read. If the people can't read, it would be even better than now. Just like you know, in Cuba, they do teach them to read, but they don't let them have any books. So it's sort of the same thing. Well, I I don't know if this is directly this is not exactly the same thing, but it's related. You ostensibly all of us we're all ostensibly illiterate when it comes to the law because. Uh, it's too voluminous for anyone to read. So this is when when the when the population becomes literate enough that they could read a few pages of laws and understand what they're subject to, you just make it into a few thousand volumes of laws, and then you might as well be illiterate because there's no possible way you could read. That's exactly right, Carter. Exactly right. No I also loved could... how. Oh, sorry. I loved how the other thing that they had was. Um, as well as using education as a tool to keep the farm animals in check, they also used fear. And for me, I found the fear that they used was like right now so poignant because particularly where we are here, um, I'm in New Zealand for those that don't know, um, and we like we have a much more strident lockdown here and they're using that fear. And like over the weekend, um, we had a situation where uh, this was people, it was a really nice weather. Some people went out walking at the beach and sitting at the beach. They were all keeping their social distance, but the police came out and said, no, you need to go back. You need to go back to your homes. And then the media have come out and said, oh, you know, if you don't behave, you'll go back under a more strident lockdown. And they kept using that fear to manipulate them. And there was a passage in the book that Squealer did exactly that. If you don't do what you're told, this is what's going to happen. I thought, wow. That's what they, they were all claiming was gonna happen right before the protest here in Denver. Like, oh, if you guys actually show up and protest, you're just gonna get us locked down longer. And I'm like, do you really think that's an argument that's gonna work against me to not show up? Because if they're gonna threaten us to do that as like a punishment, then I'm definitely going. They didn't realize you were in the chorus of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
it's 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 amazing how uh, accepting of authority figures as a dynamic that should persist into adulthood people are. Um, so many people been... just accept that there should be authority figures telling people what to do, and we should obey those authority figures. And uh, it's um, it's, it's been frankly. monumentally revealing to me about the character of the people that I know. Um, and most upsetting are the ones who I think are going out of character, what I expected them, what they've told me in the past about how they feel about things and then watching them turn into little totalitarian, you know, authoritarian knob suckers. Just, I mean, it angers me to a level I can't even describe where there are people that I will never feel the same about now that I've seen this side of their character. I went to a protest last week and, and covered it, was posting about it. And I had several people came back like very angry at me and saying, you know, you're not a patriot. Like they don't even understand like to be patriotic to them is to like just follow the leaders, totally worship them. And I said, you know, I, I'm sorry you don't think like George Washington and Patrick Henry were patriots, but George Washington would have bought, brought a cannon to the demonstration. <laughs> and fired it. I don't think you understand what the word patriot means. <laughs> yeah, like to be honest, like I agree. And that's why, like when I read Animal Farm, I actually felt a lot of disgust because we're seeing this all play out like right now in front of us. And I mean, I keep pretty quiet on social media about politics and things like that. I just post like my knitting and crocheting stuff and stuff that I cook. Um, but just, I'm there and I'm just watching everyone else. And so like, now I know who to trust and who not to trust. And frankly, it's astounding and disgusting and it's disappointing. Yeah. I mean, you guys, if you've watched our regular podcast, you probably know I'm feeling the same. I had a, I had a, um, I don't mean to get off too off subject, but I've been, I went, had a, went to a good church service this morning. It was cowboy church. It was in the, uh, it was in the rodeo arena today, which was cool. But one thing he said, he was talking about loving your enemies. And I really felt like I was supposed to hear that, whether it was at church or somewhere else, because I've really been struggling with it right now. I've been feeling disgust. That's the word lately myself. Um, and I don't know, maybe I, I, I guess it's comforting. At least it's comforting to know that I'm not the only person struggling with that. I definitely do. And um, it's, I try to just post stuff about knitting and cooking and all my dishes and whatever. And then I get sucked into it. It's just like, there's a part of me that can't, I guess it's that injustice part of me that can't let it lie. And I think we've talked about this or I've seen this discussed before the righteous anger. Um, but I think I'm getting overwhelmed with it as well. So that was a good word from you, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> I, I feel like that too. The disgust is right, righteous anger and, you know, feeling, just letting myself get angry at these friends. Um, I'm trying really hard to remember that they're operating out of fear and, um, or tell myself that. Although one of them, I mean, I swear to God, she just is like, everything they've accused, like right wing fascists I feel like I saw her just pull on her jack boots and be like start typing in like well those people ought to be arrested you know for some marginally out of step whatever so I try to keep reminding myself she's probably just operating out of fear not everybody can be brave um but yeah I, I feel like I need to step back. I've actually made a challenge for myself for this month to not open Facebook until after 10 a.m. every morning. <laughs> you don't want to do to try, to try this, not to get sucked in like that. Yeah. This That's, is a good so quote I, from Alan Monahan and Chad. I just just to round out that conversation. Alan says, be careful that anger, while justified, can make one easy to control. 
-hmm. It's the reason why agitation propaganda works so well. Yeah, that's part of the reason this, I am struggling with this and it concerns me because, you know, I see people who, um, whose ideology I abhor, who are motivated by anger and anger makes them really easy to puppeteer. I don't get, I, 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 I'm not sure I agree with that, by the way. Can I argue yeah, with that? Sure. Uh, uh, yes, being led by your emotions is, is what makes you subject us uh, susceptible to propaganda. So I'm not disagreeing with that, but, uh, I think one of the things that we've been propagandized for is we've been taught that, um, we've been taught to, to avoid conflict and that ideas are ultimately not very important and they're nothing to get angry over. And we've been taught to, to suppress anger at injustice. Um, and the reason that we've been taught that is because they don't want us to revolt against uh, an unjust system. And that anger is not only healthy, but necessary for spurring people to action. I don't think there's anything wrong with the anger. There is something wrong with letting it uh, pass unfiltered through your rational mind. But it's a, you know, so obviously you have to check with your reason whether that anger is justified and then what you should do about it. But how you placate a population is partly by making their emotions numb so that they don't get angry anymore when they see injustice. It just becomes a normal thing. Um, I mean, look at look at how look at how authoritarian governments behave, you know, someone dis is disappeared in the middle of the night and their neighbors just like shrug like, oh, that's what happens. <laughs> They're not angry because that's just, they've learned to be, that that's the way things are. They've learned to just be complacent uh, about mm -hmm. it. And I, I think anger is important and we should be uh, embracing our anger over unjust, righteous anger. I, I think the the anger is comes out of the, the ignorance from the fear that they're generating. So what they're angry at is other people doing something independent. They become furious. So it isn't that they're really angry at the government and the virus. They're angry at their neighbors. You know, like, like example, my uh, parents' next door neighbor called the sheriff because there was a guy out fishing on the dock with his brother and he owned it. It's his dock. Like that's, she's angry, furious. Right. Right. And there's a difference, you know, there's a difference between feeling the anger and then telling yourself that I'm not supposed to be angry and suppressing it and feeling the anger and then checking whether or not your behavior is then justified afterwards. Like you need to process things rationally. And then someone in the chat's making a point that like anger and outrage are two different things. Like uh, I would tend to agree that outrage is kind of like the anger comes in and I'm just going to emote back based Let on the anger. Let it flow through you. What is that, Star Wars? Right, Star Wars? that's the outrage. But that <laughs> you don't need that kind of outrage. I mean, I, I'm not sure that's the definition of outrage, but I get the distinction, right? You don't need to do that. That's dangerous. But being angry and deciding, like, what what can I do about this? Uh, they don't want you angry. They want, they, they want you to be like, oh, it's not a big deal. What's on Netflix? Yeah, we need, we need the want. fear. Maybe we need more than one word for anger and outrage. I, I think that's a good point. But it, but it is it stems from somebody that's just been totally convinced that they need to be fear and a little bit of outrage is good to help your uh, your neighbors. And there's a, I'm going to read a H.L. Mencken quote that I have handy. Uh, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins. Yes, that's a great quote. First of all, I love that word hobgoblin. So just Great for that, I'm just going to have to look that up and post it probably. Um, you know, uh, we met before we, we talked about how the animals were, had their best qualities used against them. And it, and it, it reminded me of the, without spoiling any books that we may read in the future, uh, it reminded me of kind of the Randian solution to this, which is uh, if you are Clover, stop working. Um, like you need to take those qualities that they're relying on that make you produce the very instruments of your death. You need to stop. Um, and it's the only way to defeat them is to not let them use your best against you. And I'm, I'm just throwing that out as an idea. Thoughts? I don't know. 
I think with Clover, she was being loyal to Boxer. So she would, like, she was starting to question, like, she kept going around back by, in the back of the barn to check the, you know, because her memory, she wasn't quite sure. She needed to check. And she would go around and she would check and she would get someone to read the things and things had changed. And so she was questioning her memory, but she would never go beyond that because I think her first priority and her first loyalty was always to Boxer. So I think she was led by him. It was almost like a, a really traditional loyal marriage. And, and, and then when Boxer was getting sick and he was in pain and he had the split hoof and he wasn't feeling well, both her and Benjamin, I think, were the two that kept saying, you need to slow down, you need to stop. And they tried to counsel Boxer, but Boxer was always must work out. Yeah, sorry, maybe harder. Boxer would have been a better better analogy. Like, should Boxer yeah. have just stopped? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think Benjamin and Clover, you know, tried to say that to him. They tried to have him stop. But he was so, um, he believed in the cause so purely. I mean, that was the thing with Boxer. I think his belief was so pure. And then when he did start asking questions, you know, he would ask questions and he carried enough gravitas that unlike any other animals that brought anything up that was remotely questioning that literally got them killed, with Boxer, the pigs knew they needed him. So they would allow him to ask questions to a point, but then they had, you know, they were able to throw enough out to placate him um, for this. I mean, Boxer really did genuinely believe in this greater good. You know, he believed in this vision, this grand vision that they had. And the only way to get there was to work harder. And I think, and the pigs knew that because the way that they would always get Boxer back on track when he asked a question was to say, yes, but we need to remember what we're all going towards comrades. This is what we're all walking towards. And then they would get Boxer back on track again. Do you think he understood it deeply or do you think he just understood? I mean, he clearly he didn't understand it deeply, but I don't know. I. There's like a naivete. It's like it's like a belief in the vision apart from evidence in the vision, or is it? Or was it a belief in the leaders and not the vision? Um, I th well, I think there's a, a bit of both there, but I think a lot of it is boxer. There's a lot loyalty is one of those really interesting characteristics. I think with people is that you see a lot of people that will follow a belief system or fo follow a person out of loyalty there is a loyalty there that they will follow to the bitter end and they will buy into it and they'll be loyal to that person regardless of what atrocities that they commit or they'll do and they may question it but then they'll look at look at it and they go no we need to be loyal to this cause because when you actually and I think Boxer as they talked about time going on I think there was a portion I did it on audio so they didn't run it in chapters but um, there was a portion when they said over many years had passed and most animals had forgotten, but Boxer was one of those few animals that hadn't forgotten. He'd been there right at the very beginning. He'd heard Major's vision. And I think what Boxer believed in was the dream, was old Major's dream. And that's what he was there for. That was the loyalty that he had, um, was that original dream, that, that, that speech. He had obviously had that moment in the barn and he never wavered from that. So while everything else was turning to pus around him, he was still, we must work hard and Napoleon is always right because he believed in that vision. He just believed in the purity of the cause so much that he hadn't seen that, that it had actually become a festering sore and had become infected around him. That's amazing. I, I see analogies to that in my experience in the SJW world, like so many, like Laura was saying earlier, because the people with that, with the true and like the true intent who believe in some utopian ends as everything starts to get toxic and in most of these communities there's always something like what happened in the knitting world has happened over and over again it happened in the online feminist blogging world years ago where all the ma the major feminist blogs started backbiting one another you know year and it, intersectionality just like killed all of the all of the uh, sisterhood, the friendship, it was like, you know, sniping at people for their race, sniping at people for being straight, sniping at, you know, it's like, you're not marginalized enough. And the, this incredible infighting happening. And in the midst of all that toxicity, I, was, I felt like, you know, but the ends, like if I focus on the ends, it's worth it. And I know a lot of people who are in it for that, what they think it's good intent. I think that's probably like boxer. They're looking at this thing of like, okay, this is just some unpleasantness that we have to get through. 
like if we get through the unpleasantness the utopia is there we're still heading and you can you can justify and you can make excuses for behavior that's horrible because you're like you know there were people in my life who are sjw's who I allow, I allowed to treat me in horrible ways and to treat other people, other, other people in horrible ways without saying anything because I felt like, well, they're a good person though. Cause we believe in the same thing. So, I mean, that's, it sounds crazy now. It's embarrassing, but it's true. Hey Carter. Um, the first thing that I thought of whenever you said that about why not just quit working is AOC and her telling everybody, Oh, whenever we can stop, start working how about if we just don't go back to work and I don't know why I thought about that but square that in my mind somehow I'm not I'm I can't get well it. AOC and I are like this I mean I know, we are just I know you're not, so our, our philosophies are so well aligned but um no I mean I, I think that I don't I don't know why yeah, no that. I can't feel I can't flesh it out well um I mean we may uh I was in particular referring to um, the solution in Atlas Shrugged, but which we may read someday. But you know, the idea is that if if the system is using you and your productive labor for evil, stop working, um, stop giving it your productive labor. And because here's the thing: this is the thing that um, not a lot of people have thought about, but uh, thieves thieves rely on non thieves. Right. So if you're an if you're an authoritarian or you're a thief, you actually your existence is dependent on your victims um, because it's your victims who knows how to grow corn or raise a, a farm animal or build a house. You don't know how to do that. All you know how to do is point a gun and steal. And without your victims, you would be dead. Um, and so when when the evil people rise and they they are trying to build a society that they're in charge of um, or they're being authoritarian, uh, they actually rely on the consent. And this was, a, I think this was one of the insights that Ayn Rand had. They rely on the consent of the victims, the moral consent of the victims. They rely on the victim saying, well, I really ought to go keep plowing or I really ought to go keep doing my work because I, I have to go support the system. Now, obviously, you might want to keep working to support yourself, right? But the idea that you need to keep working to support the system is exactly what they're relying on. And if you stopped, it would all fall apart. If everyone, so here's where I will agree with AOC. If everyone stopped working tomorrow and started bartering instead of paying taxes, would we all be better off? The system would absolutely collapse, right? If we started bartering between each other and none of us took a US dollar paycheck and we could survive and be happy that way, uh, the whole thing would collapse and need to get restructured. They rely on our output in order to run this system. Wars rely on your tax dollars. Bad programs rely on your tax dollars. Like that's how this runs. And so um, that's the distinction I'm making, not the AOC distinction, which is don't go to work because the government should be printing money. Uh, that's not really what I meant by that. I think you're Does forgetting. That make, that, is that clear? Well, you're, you're forgetting that AOC has an economics degree from Boston University. I'm sorry. <laughs> Keith, Wait, you're, uh, you're right. You're right, Keith. I'm sorry. Nice okay. callback. I just was having like a moment where I was, my mind was kind of clashing because I was thinking, are, are we actually agreeing with her on something? Because if we are, we're going to need to like, we're going to need to parse that out because otherwise I think she's just an idiot. No, no, we're, we're oh, look, not, I we're not agreeing. There's a difference. AOC wants everybody to not work and the government to just print to money. To pay for it. Right. We, right, we right, should right. just, right. maybe we that should the just. Difference. That's the difference. Like this group here, we should probably just stop talking about the virus and start picking a place for unsafe spaces gulch. Maybe Nicole, the mountain people. Right. Are in spot. Yeah. We're going to all move in with Nicole. Going to Nicole. She sounds yeah. like she's in a good spot. Uh, <laughs> I've got a different place in the mountains, different set of mountains. But yeah, nice. to be honest, like AB that's kind of what we're working towards where like right now I make pretty good money and I'm supporting the system. But, you know, when AOC and others were talking about a, you know, universal basic income, I'm like, hmm, you know, if I had that, I might just quit working. 
go up to my place in the Ozarks and um, get some chickens, get some pigs, Wait it and out. just make sure that I have enough cash to pay the property taxes and pay the electric bill. Pay for right. the and that's the thing that scares the that scares the government more than anything. Like this is one of the reasons that they push. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons that they push um, uh, women into the workforce and by and pushing. Not that women shouldn't work. Obviously, like if they want to work, they should work. But the reason they they don't like they don't like homes where one parent stays home. Um, this is why they want to support kindergarten uh, that's subsidized, and they want to support support preschool because if two parents work, two parents pay taxes. Uh, plus, they hey, they pay someone to take care of their kids. That's a third tax income they can tax. Whereas if two parents, one parent works and the other parent stays home, there's only one source of income they can tax. So the government hates the idea that you do labor that doesn't isn't denominated in U.S. dollars. They hate it because it, they can only reach into your wallet or into your livelihood when it's do, when it's denominated in dollars that they control. And if you raise chickens and trade them with your neighbor for some goat meat once in a while and raise your kids together with your three or four other neighbors and have your own little school system and government's not involved, they can't tax any of that crap. That sucks for them. They lose power. It's and much they're terrified them. of them. It's much harder for them to call that interstate commerce when you do it that way. And then they yeah. show up in Ruby yeah. Ridge and Waco, yeah. Hi, Alan. Yeah. Alan is joining yes. us, guys. That, we should hey, talk everybody. about that someday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Alan. Um, hey, can that I thing, Nicole, that you posted, which I had seen of that, those two police officers coming to that lady's house to say something about how she, her kid was playing with the neighbor. I mean, if if anybody doesn't see that as just, just insane. I, I mean, I don't know how you can't look at that and just be like, this is straight up insanity. I saw it posted on actually Dr. K's group. Um, and there's a woman there who responds to literally every person that responds to the video about the full story. And, you know, it is a, there is a bigger story behind that. The police had come out to her house prior in the week and dealt with other stuff with her teenage son and for some reason their PR response from the sheriff's department had to include that she'd been got she, that she had gotten a traffic ticket that week she got a speeding ticket they'd been out to deal with her son basically the sheriff's department released a statement saying you know like well this lady's a pain in the butt so you don't know the full story and I was still like I don't care about any of that background. When I watch, it was the tone of voice used by those police officers in that situation. And the way the, the female cop was like, you know, we're, we're making note of your name. You know, like we're adding you to the list. And For anyone was, who doesn't know, chilling. no, you don't, you're not cooperating and we're making a note of that. And yeah. the fact that somebody in their neighborhood who had like intimate knowledge of them knows that one kid is going over to another house's house to play. Who cares about that? Who cares if one kid is going over to another house to play? I mean, you go to the grocery store and you're like exposed to 50 plus people. How is this something that we should be worried about? It's, it's just bizarre. It's the thought, it's kind of the, I don't know, it's kind of the breakdown of logical thought that really bothers me. People that can't understand that what they're fighting in this particular instance are like, well, she shouldn't be doing that. Why do yeah. you even care? Why do you care? Oh. I mean, ugh. it's the, the circular arguments I keep getting in with people about it, you know, like, that, that want to say well, they should not be doing that. They should call the police. They should call somebody. They they are putting everybody at risk. And I'm like, if you're worried, everybody you stay knew. in your house. And they're right. like, but I that's mean, not fair because I, you know, other pe I have to leave so that I can get food. And I'm like, no, you keep telling me I can get everything delivered. So you stay in your house. It's okay. You stay there, but you can't tell everybody else to stay there to protect you. Does anybody the whole, else feel the, the low simmer and the low boil 
of its beginning to be the end of this for us. I mean, the people that are, we went out yesterday, our entire neighborhood, there must have been 10 parties going on in, yep. I'm in North Carolina. Yeah. And oh, absolutely. Have, keep, our governor keeps extending it week by week, that slow dribble of, and I think he may extend it again because of the protests and all that. Not that I care that, you know, you still should protest, yeah. but it's a slow boil that's getting ready to explode, I'm afraid. And not that I'm afraid, you know what I'm saying? You know yeah, saying. people are people are getting to the point where they're like, enough. It's all right. That's you right. know, enough. It was so busy out today when I just left right before book club. I mean, there were like hordes of people outside and I live in Boulder County. So there's always people biking and like marathoning all through the streets just constantly. And it, that really didn't back off the whole time. Every people are just really committed to exercise here. Um, but today there's like, everybody is outside. So I feel like people are just naturally sort of being like, I can't maintain this level of fear forever. And we have to go outside. Yeah, I can tell you, like in, I live in Harris County, Texas. And we've been out and about like around here for almost a month. I, I just, I first noticed it around Easter. So it's been like, what, three weeks now? Um, just every single store, every place that people could go has been packed like it was Black Friday. Um, even some of the, the grocery stores, like HEB in particular, that was known for like enforcing social distancing and everything. I'm like, I haven't seen a line in front of HEB in weeks. And it was like they gave up. And I mean, it's just, it's been insane. And I actually noticed today finally when we went driving around that the parking lots of some of those places are pretty full but more of a normal full because now that there are more places for people to go like restaurants are starting to open up a bit more heck even though salons aren't supposed to open i saw an open nail salon as i was driving down the main drag and um i mean it's almost like it doesn't matter what the government says anymore. People are starting to open up. Yeah. Can I um, take this back to the book um, quickly? There's some point I wanted to make about the beginning and I just wanted to ask, um, what version were you guys reading? Because I've got the 1996 version that Carter has, the blue one, my cover ripped off, but um, the there is a preface in the 1996 version by Russell Baker. Did anybody read that? Carter, did you read that preface? Uh, I did the first time, but I didn't reread okay. re it, no. Um, so this guy yeah. is, is like a 1954 version. 1954. Oh, that's awesome. Look at that. It's a hard to that's, that's when the preface it was, it was from the library at Eastern Illinois University. Cool. Well, the reason I'm, I'm just going to mention this briefly, because I think it, it's interesting that they picked this guy to write the preface, because he's basically telling you in the preface that Orwell got everything wrong, and that nothing like this is ever going to happen. <laughs> and he says, uh, he talks about Animal Farm, he talks about um, Huxley's Brave New World, which we read, he talks about Arthur uh, Kessler's Darkless at Noon, which I've never read. And then here's the end of his preface is, um, well, here we are in that future that so many writers 50 years ago could only guess at. And what do we see? They were ludic ludicrously wrong about the amazing efficiency oh, with which totalitarians would destroy individualism. Why did they get it all wrong? For one thing, they were men who had come to maturity in the age of the dictators. Oh, um, so it talks about like the, 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 basically the perception, the perception oh, is skewed God. because they lived through this, right? Um, yeah. They failed to allow for the stupidity of incompetence factor among people who would run the totalitarian states. Um, and then he says, uh, what was unpredictable was the liberating effect of technology. The Soviet Union could surround itself with walls but could not block out revolutionary radio and electronic waves, which stirred up the supposedly whipped human herd with an irresistible appetite for rock and roll, blue jeans, and other such subverters of totalitarian rule. 
Finally, the fearful efficiency of the totalitarian state turned out to be an absurd myth. As someone finally pointed out, making a simple telephone call in Moscow could sometimes take hours, if not days. None of this is to say that Orwell and his fellow pessimists of the 1940s ought not to be read with the greatest respect. They should be. They show us the edge of terror on which we lived 50 years ago, and they help us understand why that generation was willing to spend so much treasure and take such daring risks to keep totalitarianism at bay. He's basically like, this has no application for the future. These guys were wrong. Um, technology is what saved us. Now, I just wanted to hear some people's thoughts on that because I have mixed feelings. I'm like, he, he's right about technology, I think, helping to... Um, to subvert part of what was going on in the Soviet Union at that time. But this preface was written 25 years ago. Well, he clearly, this guy, Russell Baker, couldn't see where we're at now and what technology has wrought now. I mean, now well, technology I mean, clearly, I think, helps them. I mean, honestly- well, Harry, he's a, he has a degree who... from Johns Hopkins and he's a Pulitzer Prize journalist. So I, <laughs> I think that says it all. <laughs> Got it. I mean, he's, I mean, obviously not a person who has read any history much at all. And, you know, I'm a person of faith, so I read Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes it says there's nothing new under the sun. And if you're a person who reads history, you know that we, uh, we repeat ourselves endlessly. That is what the human race does. Harry, read the so, last sentence. I'm sorry. Yeah. So there, I mean. Oh, you go ahead and read it. Yeah. That, just crazy. It's crazy that, you know, this person would say, oh, well, that's what other people did, but we're way too, you know, informed and whatever, intelligent that we won't do this again. That's like the same sort of, like, uh, what is that called? Arrogance that has led us to be where we are now. Like, we don't, we don't realize that we're falling in the same sort of arrogant traps of our, our own envy and, you know, lack of you know, humility and things like that, that we don't even read history. We don't understand that we are just as capable of these atrocities as, as anyone else. I mean, look at the people now who are dialing the number to like call somebody in because they're out of the house and when they're not supposed to. And they can't even, like they can't even understand that they're the same sort of personality that would call in their friend that was Jewish, that was hiding somebody who was, yeah. you know, or their neighbor that was hiding a Jew. I mean, this is this is the arrogance that we have had like as american citizens i mean i've had it myself this has just been shocked <laughs> the fact that you know we have this kind of thought where we look at the germans and we're like how could they do such things this is how they could do such things look at how we're doing i mean i understand it's not the same thing i get it it's not no the it's the same personality type it's though this same like principle underneath principle that is allowing people to look at the situation and say I have the right to dial this number and report this person for doing something that I think is you know wrong when in all reality who decides that that's wrong who is it part of this well this is postmodernist oh, oh, hey, Tamara. hey Tamara's here Part of this is he missed the advances in technology that allow artificial intelligence system to act as sensors, as well as the growth of technology with the centralization of systems so that Microsoft, Facebook, Google, and a couple of other big tech companies in liberal Silicon Valley set the same standards for being nice and being respectful equals we can say death to Jews, death to whites, death to conservatives, but you criticize illegal immigration and you get censored for using the term illegal immigrant and he and nobody comments on, you know, you said illegal alien. Well, they're not Martians. Ha 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 ha. Uh, you get the censorship algorithms that I've seen on half a dozen sites where if you say Wuhan virus, the AI that monitors for X-rated comments, hate speech, and uh, intellectual property controls of don't upload Marvel movie video clips more than X seconds long is sitting there and the AI is removing the comments or warning you and if you get too many strikes it takes you down that is aside from the built-in tools where people also moderate and report you for comments and such and i'm running into as a professional writer where i'm 
I upload a comment on the Wuhan virus or the Wuhan coronavirus crisis, and I run into the AI automatically popping up and going, that's hate speech that's not allowed. Just like if you say an Islamic terrorist, no, 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 they're not really Muslim. Well, well, it's and- not even just the AI though. It is, and he did predict this, the guy that wrote the preface, which I did read because that's in this um, high school copy that was left at my house. Um, it, he, he does, because I, I wrote that this down, this quote from chapter seven. They had come to a time when no one dared speak his mind, when fierce growling dogs roamed everywhere, and when you had to watch your comrades torn to pieces after confessing to shocking crimes. And my note next to it was, sounds like Twitter. And that's yeah. just the people that are on it, not even, mm-hmm. you know, the, the AI. Um, if I can interject, Go ahead. I looked, the copyright on the um, preface is 1996, which was very shortly after the fall of communism mm-hmm. and before the internet was a thing. The internet was there, but at that time I remember getting on a forum, hitting, you know, load and go dial up and going and folding a load of clothes. And when I got back, the forum was mostly loaded. So my, that, that's a whole different world that we're living in. And that was preface is, was written in 1954. The preface. Well, she's the talking about the, she's talking about the one that I read, Nicole. Yeah. That that's the same one that I have, right? Okay. By Russell Baker. Yes. Oh, this one says 1996, 1996. right? Here. Oh, that's the introduction. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, Debbie. And you're right. I'm looking at it with hindsight. You're right. I, I'm glad you're saying this because it's. I wanted somebody to help me get it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm really frustrated by this forward. <laughs> this. I recently rewatched Babylon Five, and the optimism in that is kind of the same as this. That we're all good. All the bad is behind us. We're going to go forward, and it's going to be good. But that has that's optimism that's wishful thinking that's not the reality of the world unfortunately well you got to re- remember also though that like the the elite class the the journalists in the cathedral and like all these all these people have been tainted by postmodernism in their thinking and so they they don't think in terms of principles at all anymore they think only in terms of concrete so he might as well have said like this is ridiculous it's not true at all because pigs will never walk on two feet like Yes, but that's not the freaking point of the book. The book isn't like, it's not as concrete. They're very concrete bound. Even in 1996, I was alive in 1996 on the internet in 1996. I didn't see what the internet was going to become, but, and I had optimism, but still Animal Farm correctly, uh, correctly predicts how humans behave, how they behaved in the past how, how they deal with power, how easy it is for people to manipulate. Like technology has nothing to do with this book. Um, and so anyone who looks at it and says like, well, you know, this is, this never happened and it's never going to happen. And we're, we're past it now. It's not that they don't get technology. It's that they don't get ideas. They don't, they don't think in terms of ideas. Well, that's, to be fair, I think he was saying, and he did get some stuff. I think I agreed with like Jeanette said the last sentence, he says, is true. He says animal in, in animal farm Orwell left us a lesson about the human contribution to political terror that will always be as up to date as next year's election. At the very least, he's saying this is very relevant to elections and to like the 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 way that Snowball and Napoleon were always they it's I think it said in the book you could predict they were always going to oppose one another. They never they would never agree. It made me think of the Democrats and the Republicans. You but the people that hate Trump, you know, you know what they're going to say because it's going to be the opposite of whatever he says. Um, so I think he got that right. And and to be fair, I think he was saying, I think he's wrong in, in kind of sweeping the book aside and saying, you know, they got it all wrong. And this, this is, this is something of the past. But when he, he mentions the lived, internet, he he's sort of. He never lived to see the sesame credit system in China where you get a score yeah. and it feeds in everything from what you buy, what you spend, where you travel. The camera watched you go into a church. You lose a couple points. You 
and it does respond to feedback of your neighbors reporting on you or their checkers, their cross between a social worker and a police officer going around and you were heard arguing loudly with your wife and reports that. So there's government people who are reporters, your neighbors can be reporters, and then there's the cameras that are tracking you of, you, know, you were recorded on a camera of crossing and it wasn't at the crosswalk. We're going to ding you for illegal jaywalking and then punishments are automatically done. Humans are unique for being able to set up impersonal systems for systematic oppression, whether it's concentration camps or the AI that's moderating what you're allowed to do and then automatically bans you from the digital public square if you don't meet the standards of those in power. And we know that these systems, it's Automate it's systems that are easily automated by the more advanced artificial intelligence that learns based on the preferences, feedback, and input by those in power. And we know that these systems and the AI reflects the values of those in power because otherwise it wouldn't be implemented. It's like the electronic health records systems, getting the feedback from the AMA and putting in questions like, do you own a gun? do you have these opinions and then adding it to a database and centralizing the records that are available to any researcher or government official who sees the need they're only asking those questions because those in power reflect it yes trump is elected we still have everything from academia to media to institutional power still in the hands of liberals that's how they were able to weaponize the intelligence agencies against him to take him down and try to interfere in the election and shut down discourse. It, he's the a beginning of a swinging back, but the institutional power liberals hold is being reinforced by the automation and the artificial intelligence that they control from Facebook, LinkedIn, other social media sites, health record systems. It's across the board and it makes it much harder to organize individuals when your events get taken down from the public square. Well, you can still meet at a church or meet at a club and talk, but you can't notify and go viral and get a million people informed. They're intentionally limiting the speech. And then to quote Camus, the, the tyranny is always, the public welfare is always the justification of tyrants. When you say we're love, we're peace, we're kindness, we're the educated, we're the ones that want to take care of you. You can use the lovey-dovey maternal dystopian stuff to say, your hate speech, this is poor quality content, this is insight, this is inciting violence. So we can shut you down automatically by algorithms because we are reinforcing our own branding that you shouldn't be heard. What they don't realize is you're going to guarantee violence because people cannot quoting Dr. Jordan Peterson, if people, there are two ways you can persuade people, speech and violence. When you deny them the ability to speak in public, when you deny them access to the digital public square, when you now start seeing the anti-Trump protests allowed, but the protests of the lockdown are not allowed, and systemic oppression by removing those events and silencing those opinions, all they have left is violence. Now, I hope that we would see the change at the ballot box before it gets to the bullet box, but I see a lot of conservatives now going, yeah, liberals are right. There is institutional power and oppression. They're the ones doing it. But it now has a classic example. This guy just didn't see, didn't live long enough to see the technology yeah. implement it and impose it and oppress people using it. Thank you for listening. Well, and also, like, he may have written. I love that, Tamara. But he also oh, wrote good, a post cultural Tamara. revolution in China. It's not, Soviet Union wasn't the only authoritarian, you know, Marxist based system out there. So I don't think this guy has an excuse because he wrote it in 1996. I like, he could have easily looked at the cultural revolution and said, well, it's pretty similar to that, right? <laughs> like, it's, it, Soviet Union wasn't the only example that could be used as a, uh, you know, that Animal Farm could be a template for. Um, and obviously, tomorrow, what, you're correct about the, the technology uh, risks. Um, but I see what Debbie's yeah, saying about it being written at a specific time in history where the Soviet Union had just fallen. 
And so I think when he mentioned the internet, he was attempting to explain, and he's like at that point in history, right before all this stuff happened, he's attempting to explain how the internet helped the Soviet Union to fall without the benefit of seeing where, or the, or the, the, the ability to imagine where we could be going. So- but, but the Soviet Union would have fell anyway. I mean, it wasn't the internet. It was, it was right. the principles that it was founded on. And I, I wouldn't be fair, as fair to the guy as Kerry tried to do, but that is how Kerry is. I think you're, you're like, that you looking for something good in this guy and the guy's a jerk. He doesn't even <laughs> the point of the book. And you're like trying to find something good. And the only thing you could find good is that Orwell predicted the battle between the Republican and Democrat party over Trump or something. Like, that's, not, that's not the point. Um, I read the Kindle one you were talking about intro. It was written in 2003. It's nothing like that. And I'll just pick one passage out of it. It says, these books can be read independently of their time and place as strong preventative medicine against the mentality of servility and especially against the lethal temptation to exchange freedom for security, a bargain that invariably ends up with the surrender of both. This guy's good. I mean, he picked the part. Who wrote that? Well. Um, Christopher Hitchens. It's 2003. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Any surprise? Um, yeah, this is good. He talks about Orwell having been on both sides of the master slave during his life. He was in the military for a while, I guess. And so like Orwell saw the master slave relationship from both sides. And this guy says that's how Hitchens says that's how he could see it. It's definitely predictive of all kinds of things. You, it's not just Stalin. It's Hitler and Castro. And uh, I, I, you know, my girlfriend's listening to it, walking around the apartment doing stuff. Like I gave her a 10 minute quick overview of it. She didn't know about the book or, um, and it, it took her in 10 minutes. She's like, oh, well, you know, that, that's Nelson Mandela. You know, like, like she sees that. He kind of fooled people, got in power and then destroyed the place. She's that, South African, that, right? What? She's South African, right? Yeah, she grew up yeah, in I remember South that. Africa. Mm -hmm. she, was, she was born there. Um, she was in college in Pretoria when Nelson Mandela took over. And about 10 years later, she got out. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many people that have a lot of respect for Nelson Man Mandela. And I was raised in Africa, and I, there's a lot of people that do. But he very much was a socialist. And that's what people sometimes miss. Yeah, N Napoleon is a great character for Nelson Mandela. He's, it's exactly Nelson Mandela. And you know, it wasn't just Stalin. I, I found uh, for me what was really interesting because I first read this book in 1987 at um, Sixth Form in High School and at that time of course it was the height of the Cold War so they were using the book as an allegory to actually explain to us in utopian New Zealand that this is what the Cold War looked like and I find it really interesting now having reread it and pretty much forgetting most of it but would they actually still teach that as part of the curriculum now that we have a very left-wing socialist government which is in coalition with a far far left um, environmental party would they actually even dare to add that as part of the curriculum now because the questioning that it would actually raise about what we have particularly right at this moment um, you know because a lot of students would they ask those questions to begin with and you know how would they actually perceive it and then sometimes as I was rereading it I keep thinking you know in a way that's how clever Orwell was I mean did he write himself into the book I wondered whether or not Orwell almost wrote himself as the Benjamin character keep saying I'm a donkey I live for a very long time you know whether he actually saw a lot of these behaviors almost him saying that these behaviors are not just specific to this point in time these are behaviors that will play out again and again and again over the lens of history. Um, the players may be different, the, the scenery may be different and, and the tools used to actually portray the different um, um, fear or power or anything like that, that may change, but the actual human nature of it will remain the same. So, yeah, I, I mean, I would, so for me now, I'm a bit like, you. I mean, my boys aren't homeschooled, but they're 12 and 14, and I'm going to be getting both of them to read this now, because I don't know whether they're going to get it at high school here. You know, and Carl brought up, if there's a solution in here, um, I read a thing on, uh, about the characters, 
on online on a website. And like this says, Benjamin bears a similarity to Orwell himself. Over the course of his career, Orwell became politically pessimistic and predicted the overtake of the West by totalitarian governments. So I think part of the reason there's no solution in there is that Orwell, maybe he didn't see a solution. You know, so he didn't, he didn't try. He was Benjamin. Orwell might be Benjamin. I can huh. answer the thing on what the high schools are teaching. One of uh, one of my kids has already taken young adult literature. The other one took young adult dystopian literature. And 1984, Brave New World, and Animal Farm are on the list of options to read. But a lot of the kids are reading Divergent and the eco horror stories. And that's what a lot of the class focuses on. So this is a can be read but when i was in high school we read brave new world 1984 and some of these books that we are have been reviewing these are not covered in the class i read these in standard honors english my kids are taking an english elective that most kids don't take and these are still not covered in that class they're reading divergent they're reading the giver they're not covering these classics, so they're ignorant of it, which is why I had my kids watch the movie with me. My, my son that's a sophomore this year did read Animal Farm last year in a class that was English and history. It was like a combo class, so they covered um, historical things that would back up their literature choices. So they would studied the Russian Revolution at the same time that they read Animal Farm. This year, he's currently reading Fahrenheit 451 for his English class. So, I mean, there are some schools still doing the books they need to be doing. That's good. I'm sure that he would rather be reading Divergent. He has already read that. <laughs> but I think it is a big problem for, like, my oldest son went to school in Denver, his high school. And that school, which was much more diverse and um, urban, they didn't read really any classic books. It was much more light fiction, just on the excuse that they just want them to read anything. Um, may I pop in for a second? Sure. Uh, yeah, we so, haven't heard from you yet, Alan, please, yeah. So first on the point about um, the books being optional, uh, I can attest to that. So, I mean, I graduated high school like five years ago, but uh, I was allowed to read 1984 as a summer project, but we never actually went over any of the books in class or anything like that. Uh, and sorry, I just ran up my stairs a little out of breath. Um, the teacher gave very little feedback on it. There wasn't like any in-depth analysis of it by the class itself. And on the same list of books that you could possibly read were just like random young adult fiction and stuff like that. Uh, and on the part about like these not being taught in normal schools, uh, I would assume that Orwell is a part of the Western canon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because he's an old dead white man, um, he'll be tossed out like everything else. That's a great point. Yes. We've covered yeah, that. I was yeah. wondering too is, you know, okay, so classes maybe still read it. My son said he had read Animal Farm and he graduated in 19 or in 2014. But what kind of discussion is there? That would be a really interesting thing to know about your kids, Nicole. What kind of discussion was there about that, if they can remember? Um, I think the one that was the integrated class that he took was pretty in depth because it was two classes and they're on the block system. So they're really long classes. So he was in that class like three hours a day. So I, he had a pretty good feel for Animal Farm. Unfortunately, they just started reading Fahrenheit 451. Then they're all at home. So there won't be much discussion going on there, you know, and other than some Zoom meetings. Uh, but you can have a discussion, Nicole. Oh, I'll have a discussion. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so guys, I think, cause it's been a couple hours, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. But um, did anybody have any 
things that they points they really wanted to make or observations they had before we before we wrap up that they didn't get to make yet i had one little thing that when carter brought up about who benjamin was early i sort of was chewing on this and i think the character the archetype of benjamin is like the old wise guy who sits in the corner smoking his pipe sees everything knows almost everything and is super selective about who he shares any of that knowledge with like uh like in lord of the rings like uh, Treebeard, he doesn't talk yeah. much and he doesn't say much but when he does say something it's meaningful totally on it as an archetypal feel and the, the, he's been around forever like he's like you've never seen a dead doggy I, yeah I bounce off of that for a sec um if i remember correctly it was pol pot who instituted the year zero policy so they actually the communists had figured out that those types of people are dangerous and so it's better to just kill all the people over a certain age than allow their yeah I wasn't it's aware of that Pol Pot thing. I don't know who I was. It Pol Pot that did Year Zero, maybe. Almost positive. I mean, there's a reason they during this book is still banned at some places. There's a reason Orwell had a lot of trouble getting it published. I mean, the the intro here talks about they went to lots of publishers. Nobody wanted to publish it because the UK was partners with Russia at the time, so they didn't want to call them out. And there's like Renata is probably a reason they don't read it in South Africa schools. She didn't didn't even know about it until recently. Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely it's it's definitely an anti-authoritarian book, no matter how you slice it. So uh, I can't see any government liking this book because it <laughs> demonstrates the means by which power is is assumed and used. So. Uh, I think making it optional and making it a summer reading project is just a step to banning it entirely. Um, I'm going to find yeah, out. Yeah, it's also a step to like it. pulling it down to the same level as other books that are like, oh, it's just like this other stupid book. It's just, 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 just regular fiction, right? It's not, there's nothing special about this book. That's an important message to send to kids if you're trying to indoctrinate, right? Yeah, I'm going to find out in Florida. Like for Florida, um, they may not want to want to read it. Like in, in Florida, schools are not allowed to use old original source history books. They have to use books that are a certain age. Like I think it's 10 years and you have to get new ones. What? And I saw the one that they're using in my school. It's called A Modern American History. The title totally gives it away. A Modern American History. They changed it. I'm sure it pulls off of Howard Zinn a lot for that. Yeah, probably. 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 You guys, I was looking for this before we went, but I couldn't find it. I think it was a, I think it was Animal Farm though that we mentioned on the podcast once before, that um, that SJWs are have put out materials on how to teach it and basically subvert the actual message. <laughs> They're basically doing what happens in the book, like squeal or no, you didn't hear that. The book doesn't say that. It says this. If anybody can find that news article, please send it to me. I'd like to read it again. It sounds like a Babylon Bee article. <laughs> where they change the rules and they say, no, you misremembered what the rules were. So we didn't change it. You stupid, ignorant person didn't remember it right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Which is exactly what they do with the news now with all the news online going back and changing the stories after they release things and then they'll go make edits. And then sometimes it'll say, we changed the story, sometimes it won't. Who is it? it? Is it you, Carrie, that follows the the tr tracking the gray lady? Maybe it's Dr. Carlin mm. talks about um, a Twitter site that like archives um, mm. New York Times uh, articles so it can track yeah. how they're changing headlines and substance and all that. There's a Twitter feed that actually in real time tracks when the New York Times changes headlines, um, which I follow. I don't remember the name of it, but like, even if they're benign, it's just an automated algorithm that notices whenever, whenever the New York Times changes a headline. By the way, Jeanette just sent us five bucks and said, just a little book club fee. Thank you for the, thanks Thank for the fun. You, so, thank you, Jeanette. She's right here yeah. on camera with us. Thank you. There's a, there's a, a, a web... creepy. 
that they change title they change the titles on articles and stuff like that i mean isn't that creepy isn't it just very it's very sinister there's a web I mean, website called the, the uh the wayback machine i think is the name i've used it it archives web pages and you can go and find a date and just look up stuff it's a huge huge server i think it's called the web wayback machine yeah i use that it. quite a bit to see how they change yeah archive.is does that they're all the same um they don't unfortunately they don't have they seem to not have web pages that uh Whenever I want want it for like some particular story, they never seem to have the the page archived. But uh, but they do have a lot archived there. Yeah. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us for Animal Farm. Um, it's funny. This was I think the shortest book we've read yet, but one of our longest discussions. I felt like there's just a lot to say about this book, especially right now. And uh, I really appreciate everybody joining us. We're gonna. Probably for the next book, it, pick another nonfiction. So we'll go back and forth between fiction and nonfiction. Although this feels a little like nonfiction, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> maybe we should pick it, something that has no. Unfortunately, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick something that's just frivolous. One time, Carter, a frivolous book. I don't know. I don't know about frivolous. Uh, you know, there are people in the chat are pulling for Moon as a Harsh Mistress, which I'm on on board okay, with. Okay. Um, by the way, Andrew Thompson says newsdiffs.org uh, also does that. So, uh, and he gives us two bucks. So, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so, if you're looking for um, someone to track changes in news stories, there you go. All right, and Carter, I just wanted to show you my shirt to see if you agree. This is the shirt I chose to go out on the town today walking around. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I get a lot of thumbs up on this one and a lot of stares. Wait, Tara had a cool shirt on today too. Tara, you want to show people your shirt? Oh yeah, she did. There's a Sargon shirt in the mist. And, and look at Nicole's shirt. Yeah, I like Nicole's shirt. Wait, where where's Tara's shirt? Yeah, sorry. Oh, having some issues it's um some new speak modern day new speak it says religion of peace trans women are women and diversity is strength nice so nothing so wrong with that just. shirt doubles yes cool <laughs> have a great rest of your sunday and we'll see you tomorrow for daily cafe bye um, and if you have any comments and anybody watching who didn't join us on video, if you want to go to the Facebook group and discuss more about the book there, feel free to do that. Um, and thank you for everyone who posts there in the, in the book club. Bye guys. Bye. All right. Thanks everyone. Take care.